open conversation. And I'd like each of you to come equipped with your questions about the argument of the course or any major aspect of it. And uh, it's entirely appropriate for those questions to be related to the themes of the papers that you will be writing. Uh, today, uh, we turn to the background theme of the course. The foreground theme has been the reconstruction and especially the institutional reconstruction of the market order. And the background theme is the alternative futures of economics or more broadly of the study of the economy. And this is a, a difficult subject. It's a difficult subject for anyone. Uh, it requires engagement with the history of economic theory and more generally with the history of social thought. So all of us have, will have difficulties with it, but just uh, try to engage this argument the best you can, understanding that it is enigmatic for almost anyone. So economics is now chiefly understood as not the study of the economy, but the study of a method. The method established, proposed by the marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. The study of the economy by some other method uh, is often not regarded as economics. And on the other hand, the application of this method to subjects that appear to have nothing to do with the phenomena of production and exchange is treated as if it were economics. Now, everyone knows that there's a conventional critique of the methods of economics, of this economics, and it is a critique that is generally dismissed by the economists, I think, understandably. So the critique is that economics, this economics is based on an idealization of the rational economic agent maximizing choice within a framework of constraint and scarcity, and that Real economic agents are not like that. The economists dismiss this criticism uh, because they say uh, this idea was never meant to be a description of actual economic agents. It was meant to be an idealization that facilitates analysis. Uh, and I agree with them. I agree with them to the extent of believing that the real criticisms of marginalist economics are very different from this uh, general view, and they require a great deal more reflection. And one of my ambitions in the class today is to state what these real criticisms are. Now, let me begin with the central conception of the marginalist. Marginalist economics is sometimes also called Valrasian economics because one of its creators was Leon Valras. Uh, others were Karl Menger or William Stanley Jevons. The central conception is that we should look at the economy as a connected set of markets. And we should look at it from the perspective of the individual economic agent thus the emphasis on what is called methodological individualism, who makes choices among comparative ways of achieving his goals, of satisfying his desires, within the constraints of scarcity. These decisions that the individual makes influence at the margin relative prices, the relative prices of goods and services, and the explanation of relative prices 
became the exemplary task, or shall we say, the excuse of marginalist economics. Because, in fact, marginalist economics has never been used to explain actual detail prices, the price structure, in any real economy. Now, even at the time of its creation, at the end of the 19th century, marginalist economics was not the sole paradigm, the only way of approaching economic, a, economic life. There were rivals to marginalist economics, even on its home ground, England, one of the main sources of marginalist economics. One of these rivals was Alfred Marshall's conception of economics as a science to be developed in the spirit of natural history, a science that attended to context-specific causal sequences like the science of the weather or the science of the oceanic tides. And another rival conception, also from England, was Francis Francis Edwards' conception of uh, economics as a psychological science in the spirit of Bentham, uh, requiring the invention of a dis the invention or the development of a distinctive type of economics. So there were always these rivals, and later on in the history of economics. Uh, versions of these early rival proposals, usually more limited versions, have resurfaced. Uh, now, what were the motivations of marginalist economics? There are two paramount motivations. The first motivation was to extricate economics from a series of false disputes, of disputes that the marginalist theoreticians regarded as scholastic and sterile about the relation between value and price. So much of the pre-marginalist economics, which we also call classical economics, was concerned with the theory of value. Where does value come from in the economy? And what is the relation between value and price? So there was, for example, a discussion, a scholastic discussion, of the relation between use value and exchange value and the relationship of both of them, in turn, to the price structure. The marginalist economists developed a way of thinking about prices and about comparative choice under the conditions of scarcity that dismissed with this somewhat metaphysical discussion of value and its implications. And this was the undoubted achievement of marginalist economics, that it rescued economics from this long-standing discussion that had gone on for generations about, about value. And no one knew exactly what value was or meant or how to relate it to the price structure. The second motivation of marginalist economics is more intangible and harder to understand. And that was to develop a way of thinking about the economy that would be invulnerable to the normative and causal discussions that were then rife in European social, political, and economic thought. A way of thinking about the economy which, if enacted with sufficient rigor, could be safeguarded against these ideological disputes. And in that respect, marginalist economics, which, as I just said, is economics to a large extent. Marginalist economics has become economics or at least its mainstream, its dominant paradigm, uh, has no equivalent among the other social sciences. 
No other modern social science took this particular direction of trying to develop a formal logical or quasi-logical method that would be invulnerable to uh, disputes about normative directions and even causal theories. The only equivalent to it in the history of thought took place in legal theory and it is Hans Kelsen's so-called pure theory of law. Uh, that's the closest analogy and for the most part, of course, it's, it's not known by the economists. So the analogies of marginalist economics to Kelsen's pure theory of law uh, is not a subject of discussion. Now then, what are the real criticisms of this economics? The first criticism is its failure adequately to connect formal analysis or theory with empiricism. In the economics that resulted from marginalism, there's a great deal of formal analysis and there's a great deal of empiricism. But a simple way to state this first criticism of this economics is that the formal analysis and the empiricism have very little to do with each other. Now let me try to explain. The Austrian economists, who were among the most coherent uh, architects and expositors of marginalist economics, always understood and said that marginalist economics was much closer to being a species of logic than it was to being a causal science. So it's a purely formal apparatus that exploits the analogy, the affinity, between the situation of the individual economic agent making comparative choices under the constraints of scarcity and the framework of deductive reasoning. So this means end schema, you're the agent, you have an end, which is the satisfaction of your desires. There's the framework of uh, scarcity, limited resources. You have to choose between A, B, and C. This situation of the means and nexus lent itself to deductive representation, to representation in the schema of deductive reasoning. That was the central epistemological or methodological imperative of this marginalist economics. So the idea is you have a, a machine, a machine of analysis, and the machine runs on fuel that is supplied to it from the outside. The fuel are, is the factual stipulations, the institutional assumptions, and the normative commitments. The pure apparatus of economics, when it is conducted with relentless rigor and formality as a species of logic, uh, has no such fuel internally. It depends on it. So the fuel comes from the outside, you supply the fuel, and then the machine runs. Now, what does that mean with respect to the causal theories? What it means is that the causal theories either have to be imported from some other science, like psychology, or they have to be invented ad hoc, on the spot. The causal theories have no have no place, they're not generated internally by the analytic machine itself. That's the distinctive character of this economics. Now you could say that the situation of the individual agent facing this comparative choice under the conditions of scarcity uh, 
is a kind of foreshadowing of a causal idea, which is, of course, much easier to develop in psychological language than it is to develop in institutional language. But it's not truly a causal theory. And the proof that it's not a causal theory is that nothing that actually happens in the world, in the world that it describes, could undermine it because it's an idealization, a logical idealization, rather than a description of any particular economic or social phenomenon. Now, what has resulted is a great deal of confusion because much of the actual work of economists today working in this marginalist tradition is empirical. Uh, it involves the use of statistical methods, of correlations, and this gives the impression that economics is an empirical science. But if you try to define what the causal theories are, you can't find them other than associating them with this very abstract means-end schema of the individual making comparative choices under the constraints of scarcity. And now, what then takes the place of theory or the dialectic between experimental discovery and a theory that is central to natural science. What takes the place is the proliferation of models. So the main analytic work of the economists consists in approaching economic life with a series of models that can be formalized in mathematics. And if one model fails to work, that is, adequately to describe the part of economic life with which he's dealing, he then replaces it with another model. So, uh, this is like uh, the remark made by Groucho Marx. I have principles. If you don't like them, I have other ones. So, the the method consists in the proliferation of models. At no point in this substitution of one model by another does the background theory, if you can call it a theory, this logical schema of comparative maximizing choice under the constraints of scarcity come into question. It's never threatened, it's never replaced. And that's what distinguishes this science or pseudoscience from the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, there can be an accumulation of contrary subversive empirical observations. For a while, the theory can manage them by rearranging the relation among its parts or by making qualifications or by having exceptions. But at some point, the dike breaks and the theory is swept aside and the dominant theoretical paradigm is replaced by another one. In this economics, that can't happen. And that can't happen because the basic underlying idea this idea of maximizing choice under the constraints of scarcity was never a causal theory to begin with. It was a, a, an, a, an a-empirical, a non-empirical logical schema that depended on the provision external to it of factual stipulations, causal theories, and normative commitments. And this explains a mystery about this economics. As you know, uh, the economists have a reverential attitude to mathematics. I'll say a little bit about that more later in the class in a different context. But the mathematics that they actually use is almost exclusively a toy mathematics. 
No mathematics is used in economics today that was developed after the middle of the 19th century. So it's a mystery why there would be such reverence, such piety toward uh, a form of analysis, mathematical reasoning, that is deployed only in its most primitive form. Now, why does this happen? It doesn't happen because the economists aren't clever enough to use higher mathematics or because they're ignorant of it. It's because there would be no use for it. The, the, the only mathematics that is used in economics is this relatively primitive early 19th century or 18th century mode of mathematics, like the calculus, because that's the only mathematics that serves to do the job of expressing deductive reasoning. The mathematics that is provoked by, and by the discoveries of physics, for, for example, would have no use in, in, marginal, in, the mar, in, in the tradition of the economics inaugurated by marginalism. That's the basic explanation of this paradox of why the reverence for mathematics is then combined, coexists, with the use of a toy mathematics. So this then presents a formidable problem to the discipline of economics. It's the best organized social science. It's by far the most influential. The voice of the marginalist economists is heard throughout the world. They're, the advice that they profess to give on the basis of their science. Uh, but this reduction of the method to deductive reasoning, which is supposed to have been undertaken for the sake of invulnerability to normative or ideological controversy, results in the condemnation of economics to a kind of eternal infancy. So if it can't undermine its central theoretical model, its, its system, let me not use model because I use model in the other sense. Uh, it's paradigm, it can progress. And this is, this is then, I think, to my mind, the most important criticism of this dominant method. Very different in its character from the conventional criticism of the idealization of a rationalizing, maximizing economic agent. Let's say that's the first criticism, and there are four that I want to make. The second criticism is that this economics suffers from a fatal deficit of institutional imagination, including imagination about the institutional forms of the market order itself. So there are two identifications that are made in this economics. One identification is the identification of maximizing choice under the constraints of scarcity to the market. The market becomes the vehicle of this maximizing comparative choice. The second identification, which is much more momentous, is the identification of the abstract idea of a market with a particular version of the market. And that's the identification that we have mainly discussed in the course. So from the standpoint of its institutional assumptions, uh, you can distinguish three kinds of economics. Pure economics, fundamentalist economics, and what I'll call equivocating economics. So fundamentalist economics is the pure marginalist economics, as stated by its original formulators at the end of the 19th century. When it is conducted rigorously, it has no institutional assumptions or implications not even the implication of preferring the market. 
It was very early established in the history of marginalist economics that, the, that this system of thinking, this way of thinking, could be applied even to command economies. So that was the discussion that took place early in the 20th century about whether there could be the application of marginalist economics to the conditions of a command economy, for example, to the analytic description of the Soviet economy. And the conclusion of that debate, yes, was that yes, it was easy to establish a kind of simulacrum in which the analysis of marginalist economics could be carried over to the command economy. And then pure economics had its most elaborate form in the general equilibrium theories of the mid 20th century. So that's pure economics. And pure economics has no ideology, it takes no ideological position, but it confronts a dilemma. The dilemma that it confronts is that when it's pure or rigorous, it's impotent. And when it's powerful, to defend policies or institutional commitments, it's compromised and confused. So it's either compromised and powerful or pure and impotent. That's the dilemma. Now then there comes the second form of economics with respect to its institutional assumptions, which is fundamentalist economics. And early in the course, I associated fundamentalist economics with Hayek and his school, and I said half facetiously, Robinson Crusoe trades on his island. If he trades on his island long enough, he will eventually reproduce the whole system of 19th century German private law, the law of contract, of property, and of business organizations. In other words, the distinctive idea of fundamentalist economics is that the market order has built into it a whole system of legal rights or economic institutions. It is a package with a predetermined content. You buy the package, you open it, you discover that everything is already there. And the great objective then, when it is used for ideological purposes, is to preserve this supposedly intrinsic, this built-in legal and institutional architecture of the market order from political content. So this acquired great ideological significance in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, in 19th century American law, American legal theory, for example, a central idea was the distinction between good law and bad law. Good law was the pure private law, this law that is intrinsic to the market order. Bad law arises when a part of society, a class of society, for example, captures the power of the state and uses the power of the state to distribute advantages to itself, characteristically by corrupting or denaturing part of this impersonal neutral order of coordination. And that was the central distinction between good and bad law. Constitutional invalidation, as well as constructive legal interpretation, was used to preserve the good law against the bad law, that is, to immunize law against politics and against any attempt to use law distributively. Uh, that's fundamentalist economics. And the central attack on fundamentalist economics is, that, is the idea that we've been exploring in the course for its practical implications. The market order has no single natural and necessary form. Even when it's taken to its highest level of abstraction and generality, we discover that it has at least two dimensions. One dimension is the dimension of absolute economic decentralization. The number of economic agents 
able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. The other dimension has to do with the absoluteness of the control in scope and in time that each of those agents has over the uses at his command. The premise of fundamentalist economics translated into this language is that these two dimensions go naturally and necessarily together. The truth is that they contradict each other that one of the ways in which you might hope to extend the absolute degree of decentralization, that is to give more people access to more markets in more ways, would be to limit the absoluteness of the control that each of them has over those resources, to create claims on productive resources and opportunities that are temporary or conditional or fragmentary to take the unified property right and disassemble it into different component powers and to vest those powers in different tiers of claimants on those productive resources. The disaggregation of the unified property right. So there are any number of ways in which a market order can be organized. And we, during the semester, have explored some of those ways in responding to the practical problems of the relation between economic vanguards and economic rearguards, between labor and capital, between finance and the real economy. In each case, the most important transformation, the transformation most fertile in practical consequence, the most consequential changes are the ones that result from transformation of the legal and institutional architecture of the market, not simply from the reallocation of resources from one use to the other, or from corrective redistribution by tax and transfer, by progressive taxation and compensatory social spending. The third kind of economics with respect to the institutional assumptions and implications of economics is what I would call equivocating economics. And it is illustrated by the practice of the American followers of Keynes, that is often called operating in the area that is called macroeconomics. Uh, what distinguishes uh, this equivocating economics is its search for supposedly law-like relations among the large-scale economic aggregates of the levels of savings, investment, and employment. A characteristic example is the so-called Phillips curve, which uh, claims to establish a law-like, stable relation between the levels of employment and the levels of inflation. If employment goes above its so-called natural rate, there will be inflation. There's a trade-off between employment and inflation, and that's established in the Phillips curve. Now, the problem with the equivocating economics is the following. The equivocating economics always seems to suppose for its, what it claims to be its law-like relations among these large-scale economic aggregates, a dense institutional background. For example, with respect to the Phillips curve, uh, the extent to which labor is organized or unionized, the extent to which there is unemployment insurance for the workers, and what the level of the unemployment insurance is or the way it's delivered, uh, who has control over monetary policy, and, uh, and in the name of what ideas, is it the government, is it a central bank, is the central bank independent from the government, and so forth. All of those factors together, operating together in their complicated relations, will be decisive for the supposed law-like regularity among the large-scale economic aggregates. A critic would say, if you change any part of that institutional background, even if it's just a detailed part, 
the law-like correlation is likely to move. And indeed, the Phillips curve is now believed not to exist. Uh, so what will happen if, the, if there is an institutional and legal stagnation in the society? <coughs> as is characteristic of most of the advanced Western societies, the rich countries of the North Atlantic world today, is that it will be easy to mistake stability for lawfulness. That is, the fact that there are these apparent correlations, that they're stable or relatively stable, uh, against a stagnant institutional background can easily then lead to, to misrepresenting them as if they were the expression of economic laws. But the economic laws are no more stable than the details of that detail institutional background. And that's the problem of the equivocating economics. So what None of these three versions of economics do is to present us with a way of thinking directly about the relation between economic phenomena and their structural or institutional background. That's what this economics cannot do and does not even propose to do. Now, the third defect of this economics that results from the marginalist revolution of the late 19th century is its failure to have a view of production. So in the previous, in the pre-marginalist economics, the so-called classical economics, the theory of exchange had the same centrality to economics as the theory of production. They were at the same level, and they were independent. Now, if you open a textbook of economics and look for the chapter called Production, or the Theory of Production, you'll be surprised about what you find there. You won't find what we ordinarily mean by production. You won't find anything about the subjects we've discussed. What's the most advanced part of production? How does the vanguard of production relate to the rest of the economy? How does it change and so forth? You'll find an analytic discussion of the pricing and positions of different factors of production and how they can substitute for one another. In other words, the whole tendency of this economics with respect to the facts of production will be to treat the realities of production as a shadowy extension of the realities of exchange. And this reduction of the problems of productive activity to the problems of exchange is facilitated by a contingent empirical feature of the economies with which this economics deals, namely that in them labor can be bought and sold. And because it can be bought and sold, its transformations can be analyzed through the lens of the price system. That's what facilitated this operation. Now, there's a fourth defect of this economics, and the fourth defect is that it is a theory of competitive selection under the constraints of scarcity that is bereft of any account of the diversity of the material on which the mechanism of competitive selection operates. So imagine by analogy the life sciences, the theory of evolution. The, in the life sciences, there are two sets of explanatory ideas. There are the Darwinian ideas about competitive selection and Darwinian evolution, and there are the ideas about genetic mutation and recombination, which account for the diversity of the stuff from which the methods of Darwinian selection select. So if you had only half of the story, you wouldn't really know the value of the half that you do have, because its significance would depend on the other half, which you don't have. 
And that is the situation in economics. There's no theory of the creation of the diverse stuff from which the method of competitive selection selects. So from the standpoint of this economics, the division of the world into sovereign states that organize their economies in different ways and therefore also produce different things is an embarrassment uh, or simply a constraint. It would be better from the standpoint of this economics if the whole world were organized as a single economy under a single state because then there would be total harmony and no transactions costs. In other words, there's no account in this economics of the properly economic significance or value of diversity, of difference. So competitive selection can, ne can never be more than half of the story. The other half of the story has to be diversity and novelty, because what good is the method of competitive selection if it operates on impoverished material? So that's all, as it were, an exogenous stipulation, a deus ex machina, a gift from the heavens. It has no properly economic significance. So to my mind, those are the real criticisms, the real flaws of this marginalist economics. And as I have mentioned at the outset, they have very little to do with the common criticism of the, of the economic method as being the, ide the unrealistic idealization of a stereotype, the individual economic agent as a maximizing automaton is, according to that view, not the real person. And the economist says, oh, he's never meant to be the real person. We're doing something else. We're achieving analytic clarity uh, through this exercise. Now, let me say straight out, economics is the most rigorous, the best organized, and I said the most influential of the social sciences. And it has an undoubted advantage. It is the science of trade-offs and constraints. That's its strong suit. So what does this economics do at its best? It presents the bill to the dreamer. That's what it does. Uh, and, but it's not an adequate instrument for the causal investigation of economic life and of its transformation. It's, it's the science that, that knocks on the door and says, this costs something. There's no free lunch. Uh, there's a trade-off between this and that and a constraint on this and so forth. Yes, but that's not how we understand things in the world. The essence of understanding is always transformative the imagination of transformative opportunity. To understand the phenomenon, I've said before in our arguments, is always to subsume it under a range of possible variations in the realm of the adjacent possible, and to imagine what it can next become. That's how we understand anything. And unless we have that, we don't have the beginning of causal insight. So this science of constraints this presentation of the bill to the dreamer is, is useful, but not good enough and doesn't fulfill the role of an exploration of, of the reality of the economy. In, in every field of thought, we have to rob the actual of some of its just thereness, its brute facticity, and to reimagine it as a variation on a set of possibilities. That's how we understand anything. Uh, and that's not what this economics does. It operates by a retrospective rationalization of the established economic arrangements. And then uh, submerges them under this logical schema, which denies us any instrument for the investigation of their transformative possibilities. Now, in the 20th century, and this is going to lead me then to the second part of my account, there was a very influential economic heresy uh, 
organized by Keynes. And to understand the present situation of economics, we have to take it into account because marginalist economics has to some extent been replaced or complemented by what is sometimes called the neoclassical synthesis. The neoclassical synthesis is the combination of marginalist economics that I've just described and defects I've just discussed with a diminished version of Keynes's economics. Uh, now, first, let me say what are the limit, what Keynes did, and what the limitations of Keynes's economics are. So. Keynes called attention to the fact that all previous economics, both classical and marginalist, had not taken money seriously. It had treated the economy as if it were a barter economy. And he therefore proposed to study the economy as if money mattered and our attitudes to money. Second, he observed or established that supply and demand can come into equilibrium, into balance, at different levels of economic activity. They can come into balance at a high level of economic activity with full employment, or they can come into balance at a low level of activity with underemployment. And this then had crucial economic significance because if the balance is achieved at a low level rather than at a high level, always assuming this idea that there are multiple equilibrium, multiple equilibria, some good, some bad, then we have to take the economy out of the bad balance to put it in the good balance. And that then justified governmental activism in the form of fiscal and monetary policy. Those were the three crucial contributions that Keynes made. And what can we say then about Keynes's economics in this same spirit of my criticisms of the economics that marginalism created? The first is that he continued and to some extent radicalized the tendency of English political economy, even before marginalism, to be psychological rather than institutional. All of the crucial categories in Keynes's system, uh, the preference for liquidity, the propensity to consume, the state of long-term expectations are psychological categories rather than institutional categories. And they point back then to the methodological individualism that animates the whole system. So if we are interested in the transformation of economic institutions, we must be interested in the institutions. Uh, and Keynes's economics is a psychological economics focused on the psychological phenomena like elation and despondency, fear and greed, rather than on the institutional realities and the institutional alternatives. When he deals with institutions in his so-called general theory, he deals with them in relation to particular organizations like the stock market. He has no comprehensive institutional view of the economy as a whole. Now, second, Keynes's focus practically was on the demand side rather than the supply side of the economy. And therefore, his influence helps explain the failure of his disciples and more generally of the progressives to develop a progressive approach to the supply side of the economy. The whole focus is on demand, on inadequate demand, on the raising of demand, 
on corrective redistribution by tax and transfer to support demand, but there's no idea of the transformation of the supply side. And the problem is that the basic source of instability in the economy always has to do with some failure of supply and demand, not just to balance each other, but to ignite each other. That is, what would be perpetual economic growth? It would be growth in which continuous breakthroughs on the demand side inspire breakthroughs on the supply side and vice versa. Then economic accumulation or revolution would go on forever. And if it doesn't go on forever, if there isn't this reciprocal incitement between breakthroughs on the constraints on supply and breakthroughs on the constraints on demand, we have to understand why. And then we have to have an economics different from Keynes's. Now, the third defect is that insofar as Keynes's major work, the general theory of investment, of employment, interest, and money, was meant to be a theory of slumps, of economic slumps, of economic crisis, responding to the calamitous realities of the Great Depression of the 1930s. It wasn't at all a general theory, despite the title of his book. It was a theory of a particular kind of slump, a kind of slump created by inadequate demand, by consequent subemployment, uh, and by the rigidity, the downward rigidity of a particular price, namely the downward rigidity of the wage. Keynes's theory was a theory of that kind of a slump. And it turns out that's far from being the only kind of a slump. So in the late 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century, economists had became concerned with a different kind of slump, sometimes called balance sheet recessions, in which the crisis was brought about by the exorbitant growth of leverage both household debt and business debt under the conditions of the so-called cheap money policy, which was the very opposite of the realities with which Keynes was dealing. Governments and central banks that made money cheap, that facilitated credit, and this extension of leverage. And that led to a completely different kind of slump. So we do need a general theory of crisis, a general theory of slumps, but Keynes's theory is not it. And that then leads to a fourth uh, flaw in Keynes's theory, which is that it's characteristically caught in a middle position between being a general theory of permanent, of perpetual economic disequilibrium and being a theory of a particular kind of bad equilibrium which was the equilibrium of the slump based on hoarding, excessive saving, uh, diversion of the excessive saving into non-productive investment, inadequate demand, downward rigidity of the wage. And what explains this? Keynes is a brilliant theoretician, uh, but something which is not epistemological, I think, but moral. Uh, Keynes's occasional writings of the 1920s are more profound than his theoretical work of the 1930s, his general theory. Uh, and this is because Keynes uh, wanted to shine, he wanted to influence, uh, as many other economists have wanted to influence. And, uh, Therefore, he chose as the premise of his theoretical work, the general theory, one particular approach to the slump, the approach of a pump priming, of the activation of demand by monetary policy, by fiscal policy. Uh, and he himself, in his occasional writings of the 1920s, reveals that he thought that there were other approaches to this problem, 
One of them was governmental influence on the investment decision, therefore on the supply side, not on the demand side of the economy. But he regarded that as unpalatable because it would associate him with the left and with socialism. And therefore, the choices that explain the direction that he takes in his theoretical work are governed by pre-theoretical, strategic or tactical presuppositions, which can't be explained by anything in economic theory, but are the result of his attitude of uh, worldliness for the desire for worldly influence, uh, in which he was very different from the two greatest thinkers in the history of economics, Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Uh, now then, what happened to Keynesian economics? Keynesian economics was assimilated by the American economists in the period after the Second World War, and they defanged it. They took out the poison, everything in it that was troubling or embarrassing or subversive, and they, they downsized it by transforming it into uh, the theoretical foundations of monetary and fiscal policy of counter-cyclical management of the economy by fiscal and monetary policy. And it was then called macroeconomics. So the marginalist economics, the main body of economic theory, was relabeled microeconomics. And the Keynesian addition to it, now understood as simply the theoretical foundations of fiscal and monetary policy was called macroeconomics. So what had become as a rivalry between two theoretical paradigms, two different ways of thinking about the economy as a whole, which as I say could have led to the idea of Keynesian economics as a theory of perpetual disequilibrium in the economy rather than as a theory of just one bad equilibrium, ended up as the title of two chapters in the same textbook. So now you open the American Introductions to Economics, and you see there's, a part of, there's one part about my, microeconomics, and there's another part of my macroeconomics. So they're downsized, they're reconciled with each other, uh, there's peaceful coexistence, and Nothing about the fundamental economic order is threatened. So that's what happened. Uh, and that's, an, that's the essence of the so-called neoclassical synthesis. Then the last chapter in this narrative is one that was foreseeable, which was once Keynesian economics had been diminished in this way, and reduced to this role as simply another part of the same synthesis rather than a rival for the hegemonic position, it started to be attacked from below. And the view began to be uh, conveyed by the economists that what was true about this diminished Keynesianism could be expressed in the language of the previous economics, and what was truly new about it was false. And this was work that was done then under the label of the so-called micro-foundations of macroeconomics. The micro-foundations means to take away its Keynesianism and to leave only the other part, the part that was there before, the part that dispensed Keynes. So the Keynesian revolution having been downsized initially by Keynes himself, uh, who already gave the first push toward this downsizing, then was further undermined by this work of regarding its novelties as false and its truths as conventional. Uh, now there you have an account, a polemical account, a critical account, of the situation of the mainstream of economics. Uh, and I now want to go to the last part of my argument, 
uh, which is what's what's missing from from this, uh, and in what way the problems and tragedies of economics communicate with the situation of the social sciences and policy discourse generally. So if you now look at the whole field of social and historical study, uh, you see that there's something common to all of the elements. What's common to all of the elements is the suppression of structural vision and of any intellectual instrument by which to understand the creation of alternatives. And as I said, insight into alternatives, the imagination of transformative possibility, is insight, is the basis of all insight. Without that, we don't have insight. We have retrospective rationalization. So you could generalize in the following way, that the, the hard positive social sciences generally represent the arrangements of social life under the lens of some kind of retrospective rationalization. They're what we call, in the history of philosophy, right-wing Hegelianism. The real is rational. But each of them does it in a different way. And economics does it in a way that is unique, as I have argued, because its discourse is not really a, a species of causal inquiry at all. It's a kind of logic. Then the normative disciplines of political philosophy and legal theory do it by pseudo-philosophical justifications of the ameliorative practices of compensatory redistribution under social democracy and of the idealization of law in the language of impersonal policy and principle. So there are two main normative disciplines. One is po political philosophy, like the theories of justice, of distributive justice, like the Rawlsian theory of justice, for example. And the other is legal theory. So the theories of justice uh, are mainly concerned with the justification of compensatory redistribution. So they combine a, an avowed egalitarian profession of faith with institutional skepticism or agnosticism. And if you sum up those two elements, the egalitarianism and the institutional skepticism or conservatism, the sum of those two elements is the justification of, cor of correction, of redistributive correction. That is, you say, the market is what it is. We, it's, it's a brute fact. We can't change it. It's necessary. It's, it's an instrument for the creation of wealth. Unfortunately, it generates inequalities. So we'll come after the fact and correct those inequalities through progressive taxation and redistributive social spending. We'll humanize the market. Uh, that's institutionally conservative social democracy. And the legal theory then represents the law as the expression of connected principles of impersonal right and policies responsive to the collective interest. So the regulated market economy, the mixed economy, this particular way of combining the mixed economy with the state, is presented again as the way to humanize the established order, which is taken as it is, but it needs to be humanized. Uh, this order is neutral with respect to sectarian goods, although we know that no institutional framework can be neutral because every institutional framework tilts the scales in favor of some forms of experience and against others. And the false idea of neutrality, which entrenches and immunizes the system against attack, has a kinship to a, another idea which is valid and even indispensable, 
which is that we want the institutional lawyer to be open to a wide range of contradictory experience and above all to be corrigible, to be capable of revision in the light of experience. So these theories of justice then uh, create these philosophical or pseudo-philosophical justifications of the re of compensatory redistribution and the legal theories then attempt to make the law better by casting it in an idealizing light, supposedly to the benefit of the groups most likely to have lost out in the politics of lawmaking, representing the law and the vocabulary of impersonal principles of right and policies responsive to the public interest. It's the humanization of the order. So first we have the rationalization of the order in the positive social sciences, then we have the humanization of the order, and then what do we have in the humanities? The humanities then embark on a roller coaster of subjective adventurism, detached from any attempt to reimagine or reconstruct society. And based on this fateful parting of the ways in the 20th century between leftism and modernism. Uh, and so these, we have these three tendencies of rationalization, humanization, and escapism. And they seem to be opposed. Their adepts claim to be enemies, intellectual enemies and political enemies. But we know that they're not opposed because they converge in the disarmament of the transformative will and the transformative imagination. So what do we need? Uh, uh, we need a theory of structure and structural change. And economics should be one of the voices of that theory of structural change. So let's first ask whether classical economics, the economics that preceded marginalism, was that theory of structural change in the economy. So what were its defects? The first one I mentioned, its absorption in the scholastic disputes about value and the relation of value to price. Second defect uh, that we see very clearly in both Smith and Marx a great exaggeration of the, of the functional necessity of coercion in economic life. So Smith argued that the brutal, the brutalization of labor under the division of labor, the technical division of labor, the extreme specialization, was required for production. Karl Marx argued that the functional necessity of class societies in, in history was the need to have a coercive mechanism for the extraction of a surplus over current consumption. In fact, we now have reason to believe that there was no real functional justification of these coercive realities. Uh, there wasn't a course of extraction of a surplus. There was coercion, and coercion can be explained, but it can't be explained because it was functionally necessary. The aggregate level of saving in Britain on the eve of the Industrial Revolution was lower, not higher, than the aggregate level of saving in the great agrarian bureaucratic empires of the rest of the world. What distinguished the Europeans was a series of innovations, technological, conceptual, social, cultural, which then allowed for the Industrial Revolution and took the world by storm. It wasn't a higher level of saving extracted coercively from the mass of the people. But the third problem with the classical economics was that in both Smith and Marx, it suffered from a false view of structure. In Smith loosely and in Marx perspicuously, clearly, they had the, Smith called it commercial society. It was a regime with its own logic. Marx called it capitalism, one of the modes of production. So 
Marx understood that the structures of social life are not like objects of nature. We made them. And because we make them, we made them, we can understand them from within and we can change them. But this revolutionary insight into the structures is a kind of frozen fighting, our artifacts. He then circumscribed, eviscerated the, the, this revolutionary insight by surrounding it with a series of qualifications which emptied it of its revolutionary content. The first is that there is a closed list in history of these regimes. He called them the modes of production, the slave society, feudalism, capitalism, socialism. So, and history presents us with this elenchus, with this closed set. The second is that each of these regimes is an indivisible system, which either is reformed and maintained or replaced all at once. So the, the implication of this thesis of indivisibility is a binary view of politics, Politics is either reformist or revolutionary. It's either the reformist management of the existing regime or it's the revolutionary substitution of one indivisible regime by another. When in fact, almost all structural change in history is piecemeal and fragmentary and can nevertheless then become cumulative if it continues in a certain direction. And third, that there are laws of history governing the full ordained succession of these indivisible systems. All of those ideas are false. And we know that they're false by our discoveries of what's going on in history and by our practical political experience. So that's the classical theory of structure with its revolutionary insight into the artifactual character of the structures, but its surrender then to these illusions of false necessity. In contemporary social science, on the other hand, we get rid of those illusions, but only at the cost of suppressing structural vision altogether. Uh, and so that's where we stand. Uh, bereft of any adequate understanding of structure, structural alternatives, structural discontinuity, that's our situation. And uh, this is not the occasion then to develop or outline a theory of structure, but I'll simply state three sets of attributes which any adequate way of approaching structure must have in general and therefore also with respect to economic life. The first is that we must understand that structure, a regime, shaping the routine conflicts of social life, and especially the way in which we create the future from the present through organized conflicts about the future creating resources of economic capital, political, political power, and cultural authority. Every structure, in a structure, all of the elements tend to reinforce each other. That's true. But they're not a system. They aren't created all at once and they don't change all at once. They're a structure, but they're not a system. And the dominant form of structural change in history is radical reform, revolutionary reform, which is piecemeal, but structural. And that's the only way in which, for the most part, structural change happens. The idea of total change is, for the most part, a fantasy, a limiting case. And its practical function in the world is to serve as a justification for its opposite. If real change is this total change, and total change is unavailable or too dangerous, then what's left to do is to humanize the world. And so then we go from a disappointment with a Marxist idea to the institutionally conservative social democratic surrender, that's the characteristic situation. Uh, the second attribute which a theory of structure must have is that it must account for the way in which the same functional advantage, the same level of economic development, of military power, 
can be sustained by alternative economic arrangements. There's never a one-to-one -one relation between functional advantage and institutional presupposition. There are always alternative institutional bases for the same functional advantage. And uh, what happens then is that when there's an innovation in the world, the tendency is to assimilate that innovation in the form that least disturbs the ruling interest and the established preconceptions. And as I've said before, the insular knowledge economy that we've studied is a characteristic example of this path of least resistance. The path of least resistance always has an advantage that by definition is closer to what exists and it's tangible, it's what's there, it's what least impo implies or requires opposition to the dominant interests and ideas. But it has a disadvantage that it characteristically underdevelops, understates the potential of the innovations. And we see that exactly in the knowledge economy. The insular knowledge economy fails to achieve the potential of the knowledge economy, develops that potential in perverse and incomplete forms. The alternative knowledge economy for the many would vastly increase our economic and technical powers. But it requires much more transformation, including transformation of the way in which the different classes understand their interests. The third attribute which an adequate theory of structure must have is that it must deal with the following problem, which is uniquely ours of our historical situation. Like the liberals and socialists of the early 19th century, we have reason to understand the primacy of structural alternatives over non-structural solutions to the problems of society. Uh, a, structural solution, a structural problem requires a structural solution, not a form of humanization or escapism or rationalization. Uh, but unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, each of, w each of whom each sect of which had a fetish, a program. They said they had a dogmatic commitment to a particular institutional project. You say, establish the system of liberal rights and you'll be both free and rich. Or give the state control of the economy and it will be the path to human emancipation and to the development of the forces of production. We have reason to doubt the adequacy of any of these dogmatic institutional blueprints. And therefore, we have a problem without precedent in historical experience, which is the need to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. And the implication then for our institutional projects is that among the attributes of our institutions, the attributes that they should have, one of the most important is that they, that they invite their own revision, that they facilitate and organize their own transformation, that they have this character of representing the organization of a form of collective experimentalism in the economy, through the market or the reconstructed market order, and in politics through a high energy democracy. Uh, so those, the, 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 that's not the outline of a theory, obviously, of structure. That's simply the enumeration of a set of attributes that we would want a more adequate approach to structure to have. And any adequate study of the economy should aspire to these attributes. It must be a structural theory, a theory of the transformation of structure, for which 
the 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 re the reordering of the market is the crucial point. The reconstruction of the market order to deal with the problems that we've addressed during the semester. But to do that, we have to have the right attitude, the right presuppositions about structure, structural change, and structural alternatives. Now, finally, I want to return to the point of the worldliness of economics at the end, because this is a somewhat otherworldly project that I've described. Uh, Adam Smith and Karl Marx were both otherworldly. Adam Smith was otherworldly and sweet. Karl Marx was otherworldly and angry, indignant. Uh, but they were both otherworldly, unlike Keynes, who was very, very worldly and wanted to shine and to influence and so forth. And on the topic of worldliness, I want now as a kind of coda to this account of economics to say something about uh, the worldly prizes. So I say that will give you a sense of the, the, the problems of economics, why it's a, a, a challenge. So, uh, you know, there's a prize, there's a so-called Nobel Prize in economics. And all the leading economists in the world hope to win this prize. I assume they, this is vying for this prize. Uh, and the, the Nobel Prize in economics is not a real Nobel Prize. Huh? Nobel Prizes were established at the beginning of the 20th century by the, by, under the will of Alfred Nobel. Uh, who was a Norwegian entrepreneur uh, and inventor of dynamite and of other things. And there are prizes in the natural sciences and there's the Peace Prize. Uh, the Nobel Prize in economics was established by the Swedish Central Bank in the early 1960s. It's called, as a matter of fact, something like the Reichsprize, the, the Swedish Central Bank Prize in the Economic Sciences in the honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel. The Swedish Central Bank decided to organize this prize for extremely practical and very clever reasons, which is they were at that time in an, a long-standing struggle with the Swedish Social Democrats, a party that had been in power forever in Sweden. And in order to increase their margin of maneuver, of autonomy, they very intelligently thought it was necessary to enhance the prestige of economics, I means this economics that I've been discussing in Sweden. And what better way to do it than to establish this this prize, supposedly in the memory of Alfred Nobel, which would be called the Nobel Prizes, and mistaken for all the other Nobel Prizes. And so they did this uh, with a very clear intention of putting the Swedish government in its place and enhancing their margin of autonomy. Uh, and it was a, a brilliant maneuver. It's worked fabulously. So. The family of Alfred Nobel brought a lawsuit in Stockholm to prevent the Swedish Central Bank from undertaking the cynical maneuver uh, and saying this is an exploitation of the name of Alfred Nobel. And the lawsuit failed. You can understand why. It's very hard to say, to, 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 to defeat a proposal by someone who pretends to honor the memory of a dead person. Uh, and saying you can't do this. So the loss the loss of trail. And then so every year we have these economists who manage this economic time who stand up huh, in Stockholm, get their prize. And every few years a member of the loyal opposition, uh, like the humanization people or so, 
stand up or the development people. Uh, and they also get the prize, so everyone is contented and happy in this arrangement. Uh, so this shows you just so the, the prestige of this discipline, its worldly influence, uh, and its betrayal of the higher hopes of insight and of transformation. But this is the world. Uh, this is the world in which this very worldly discipline operates and in which we somehow have to fulfill the impossible command of being in the world without being of it. Now that's all I had to say about economics uh, and we have some time left to discuss this. I've said a lot, I've claimed a lot. So I'm open now to your comments and questions. Yes? Are there alternative economists or an alternative branch of economics that you think is going in the right direction? It's very hard to answer that question because uh, many of the most insightful, much of the most insightful work is not described as economics. It comes from somewhere else because it's not in this method. Uh, I think that there's this problem that I addressed at the last part of my remarks, that another economics is, is, is really another social theory applied to the phenomena of production and exchange. That is, we need a way of thinking about structure. Um, but, but here's an example. So take the arguments I've been making in this semester. Uh, are they economics? Is this economics? So. I think most economists would say, well, this isn't economics. This is some kind of philosophical or political discussion of economics. But it's not economics. Uh, and so we, I don't know how to answer your question. Uh, it, I, it seems to me that all we can do is to seize on these questions. These are the real questions. And, and to pursue them. And it doesn't make much sense to pursue them within the, the confines of these disciplines, right? Because in the university system, the university, one of the premises, the, among the premises of the organization of the university system are two. One of them is the coerced marriage of methods and subject matters. And economics is actually an extreme example of this. So economics is not the study of the economy, as any outsider might suppose it to be. Economics is the study of a method, of this method. And whether or not it's applied to the, to, to the economic phenomena. Uh, so that happens in every department of the university, more or less explicitly and drastically. Economics is just an extreme example of it. But for example, it happens in physics. So uh, fundamental physics is studied by a structural anti-historical method. Even though we know since the 1920s that the universe has a history. And we know that the, ulti the ultimate constituents of nature are described by the standard model of particle physics. And the laws, constants, and symmetries of nature that we now think exist could not have held in the very early moments of the universe. So we would have to have a historical study of the universe, right? Cosmology should be the, the fundamental natural science and uh, structure should be subordinate to, to history rather than the other way around. Uh, second characteristic of the university system is that all of the disciplines rest on an inarticulate, inexplicit philosophical foundation, a metaphysical foundation, which is then married to the hardcore of empirical discovery as if they were inseparable. And they're not inseparable. So it's like relativity, the, 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 the concept of a four-dimensional non remanian manifold, an ontological concept, which is then used 
to explain Einstein's general relativity is, is, is a metaf it's, it's a metaphysical conception. And the same empirical discoveries could mean something else if married to different metaphysical presuppositions. So the whole organization of the university is based on the suppression of these intellectual alternatives uh, and on these coerced marriages of methods and subject matters. So that's the way things are. So uh, part of the purpose of education has to be to liberate ourselves from these dogmas and to be able to have greater freedom in approaching them. So uh, that's what's implicit in this argument I've been having during the semester about economics. It's just an example of this operation in one particular discipline. Now, it's an example that has particular significance, practical significance, because it has to do not just with enlightenment, but with, with emancipation, with freedom. Uh, I, mean, I think this is one of the great questions in, in, raised by my arguments in the courts. As I've, as I've said early on, Keynes and Marx believed that, that the economy is a nightmare. It's a nightmare of scarcity. Uh, work, instrumental work for the sake of economic necessity is a nightmare. And as soon as, and, we're, and then they thought, we're on the eve of overcoming scarcity. As soon as we overcome scarcity, we'll be able to free ourselves from this hateful burden of practical work and to devote ourselves to what really matters, which are our private sublimities, right? Our, our avocations, our, the things that we're really interested in. Now, I don't believe that at all, either of those propositions. We're not about to overcome scarcity. Scarcity is endlessly reproduced in new forms. But on the other hand, we can aspire to freedom in the economy and not just freedom from the economy. We can find a different way of organizing the market, a different way of organizing work, and so forth. So these are momentous practical political questions also, but they're inseparable from these intellectual disputes. And that's what makes them so difficult. Yes. How did how was Keynes appropriated by the representatives of modernist economics yeah. to form this neoclassical synthesis? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the problem started with Keynes himself. Keynes, as I said, Keynes began by downsizing his own insights. It's not just that he was some great lonely genius, and that these opportunists came afterwards and uh, distorted what he said. He, he started out, he started the distortions himself for the reasons that I've stated, because he didn't want to be seen as a leftist, because he wanted to influence, and because he distinguished what was palatable and unpalatable and so forth. Then his disciple John Hicks uh, simplified the teachings of his book in a schema, uh, of these curves that are now in every economic textbook, and that facilitated the simplification. Then the American, his American disciples came along, like Paul Samuelson, and uh, they then carried this process one step further. And they then reconceived Keynes's economics as a theoretical basis of the counter-cyclical management of the economy by fiscal and monetary policy. So the economy goes, goes into periodic recessions. Fiscal and monetary policies would then counteract these slumps. And the theoretical basis of it was Keynesianism. And say, we don't have to think of this as an alternative way of thinking about the economy that can end up in some kind of incineration of marginalist economics. It's just an add-on. It's just another part. It's a theoretical foundation of this administrative practical work uh, 
of counterstick with a politic. That's why I say that what had started out as a rival paradigm ended up as another chapter in the same textbook. And peaceful coexistence was established. So this was the Americans, his American followers, the American Keynesians, who then uh, rendered Keynes politically untroubling, pragmatic, having this pragmatic role of explaining and justifying fiscal and monetary policy. Then comes the last chapter in the narrative, which is, as it were, the punishment for the worldliness. The punishment is that then the right comes along, the right in economics, and says, well, this wasn't really necessary anyway to start with. Everything that's good in Keynes could already be found in the previous marginalist economics. And we can dispense with all of this other stuff. Like, for example, the idea that there's a multiplier effect, that when you pump up demand, it has a series of virtual effects on the economy. We can dispense with all of that. And we, the, the justifiable core of Keynes's insights can be inferred simply from the pre-existing marginalist economics. So that's the final chapter in the story. So first you cave into the empire, then the empire strikes back and annihilates you. That's the story of the world. So it's back to the principle that in history, uh, rebellion is not always rewarded, but obedience is invariably punished. And, and the, the same lesson keeps being repeated endlessly. Yes? I had a quick question about the rotating capital auction idea that you always yes. bring us back to. Yes, what I call capitalism without capitalists. Yes, so in that idea you mentioned that there would be these representatives who have the trust giving the assets to those who can assure the highest rate of return. So I guess my question would be, how would those representatives in your ideal mind, or in your, in your mind, actually determine what return is, or what, what, what return should be valued societally? What do you mean what the return is? The return is the direct economic return. That is, under that system, first of all, this is just a thought experiment, yeah. right? It's just to indicate a direction. And, and I think the first thing to say about that hypothesis, which is that you, you, you vest the productive assets of society in independent trusts. They're not private owners. They're not the government. It's not discretionary allocation by government. The trusts conduct a rotating capital auction. And whoever can assure the trusts of the highest rate of return gets to use those productive assets temporarily. That's the basic idea. Then the, the underlying rate of interest is then the charge for the use of the productive assets of society. The main form of public finance becomes not taxation, but this rate charge for the use of the productive assets of society. So that's, that's the basic idea. Now, uh, w what then is the question? So the rate, it's, it's, so now, I think what's, what's interesting about this thought experiment is that the thought experiment on one side describes something that seems incredibly utopian, revolutionary, and so forth. Uh, looked at from another aspect, looked at from the aspect of finance theory, it describes supposedly what already happens. That is, the orthodox theory of finance says the capital markets, as they are now constituted, allocate resources to their most effective uses and users. And so if you have a phenomenon like the so-called spontaneous privatization in Russia, in which a bunch of bankers and oligarchs uh, uh, robbed the Russian people and the Russian state, took over the productive enterprise. And, but as part of the initial organization of a market, what the orthodox neoliberals and finance theorists would say is, it's unfortunate that there were these distributive distortions at the outset, but in the long run, it doesn't matter. Because if the market operates competitively, those productive assets will end up 
in the hands of their most efficient users. Even though some of the uh, upstream people who got the assets will be able to skim off some rents before they ultimately fall into the hands of their most efficient users. So what I say is to happen through the, these capital auctions is supposedly, according to the orthodox finance theory, what already happens. Uh, and then we can test the difference between a world in which we call this bluff and to see whether it actually happens this way uh, uh, or, uh, or not. But this gets us off track of today's debate, which is about economics. Yes? I have a similar question related to, to that thought experiment. I think I don't understand two things. Like it's, are you talking about a monetary auction? And another question is, how do you prove that you will, like, uh, no, of course. The resort, the asset uh, no, of course. There, there are a thousand questions. There are a thousand problems. Yeah. But, but I'm imagining a situation in which there's a lot, there's a large multiplication of these productive trusts, and they're operating under different regimes or different criteria. So someone has obviously there's a team of entrepreneurs and technicians. They should have worked up some track record to show that they're reliable, that they can do stuff entrepreneurially. And there'll be a competitive judgment. But that already happens. When a venture capitalist has to give money to someone, he makes a judgment of whether those people are reliable. So there are a thousand details, and then there's the time horizon. What's the time horizon of the return of the assets? It could be multiple time horizons. But remember what I said. I said, the idea is not that this would be the sole way in which capital would be allocated. It would just be one of the ways. So we would always want to have, among the different forms of decentralized organization, decentralized allocation of capital, the unified 19th century property right, the absolute property right. That should be one of the forms. It just shouldn't be the only form. It has a justification. The justification of the unified absolute property right is that it allows the owner, the absolute owner, to do something at his own discretion, at his own risk, that no one else believes in. If, if, I, if I don't have absolute property, I have to go to the trust. I have to convince them that I'm reliable. I have to deal with the local governments, with the politics, with this, with that. I have to negotiate a series of agreements and vetoes. There's a way of circumventing all of that. It's called absolute property. That was one of the justifications of absolute property. It just doesn't make sense as the only way in which the decentralized allocation of capital should be organized. It should be just one of the ways. So a basic idea here is that the market order should not be nailed to the cross of a single dogmatic version of itself. We should have a range of different ways of organizing the decentralized allocation of, of capital. Then we can see empirically and experimentally what works and what doesn't work, rather than committing ourselves dogmatically to a central form. Now, there's a subtlety in the ideological debate in the world now, which I think is not widely understood, which is the following. In the 19th century, the belief of the liberals and of classical legal science, for example, was that the, the maintenance of a particular set of, a, of, of the classical system of liberal legal rights was part of the very nature of freedom. It was the, the conception of the scheme of ordered liberty and that was freedom. That was their conception. There was a dogmatic belief in the necessity of this order to the preservation of economic and therefore political freedom. Now the dominant belief in the world seems to be different, but it's not clearly understood. The dominant belief is not as this belief was, that this is part of the conception of freedom. The dominant belief is it's not part of the conception of freedom. But as a practical matter, there's no way of replacing it without threatening freedom. That's the belief. It's a negative, practical belief. 
It's not that the liberal system of rights is intrinsic to the definition of freedom, is that there's no way of subverting it or replacing it without engendering a threat to economic and political freedom. So that way of rephrasing the problem, this negative, empirical, pragmatic way, then puts the whole weight of the argument on the question, well, what are the alternatives? Are there alternatives? Because the premise of this, of this negative belief is that there are no alternatives. That's the premise of it. The alternative would be the state takes control. So that, that's, and that happens again and again in the contemporary ideological disputes. But I think here we, and I want to come back to the discussion of economics. Uh, so there's, there's an enormous epistemological challenge, right? Uh, you, you have to know a huge amount about history, about, about every aspect of society in order to be able to develop ideas about these things. And then there's a moral challenge, which is you have to be able to resist. So, and so I've seen this again and again. I commented on one aspect of this before in the course. But, so let's take the question of who is, so the, the economics departments of the leading American research universities, like MIT and Harvard, now have hegemonic influence on economics worldwide, all over the world. And I'm including all the major developing countries, including China, the research departments of the, the economics departments of the American research universities have huge influence. And who are they? So uh, the economics professors, very few of the economics professors have any direct acquaintance with the history of their own discipline. They don't know the history of economics. Many of them have not even read Keynes, uh, and they, they, uh, they haven't read the marginalist theoreticians. What's the typical profile of an Ameri a young American professor of economics today? I'll tell you, uh, so you can tell me whether you think this is promising. So there's a whiz kid from the Midwest, for example, who was great at mathematics. Then he comes to Harvard and he concentrates in mathematics. The mathematics department is only interested in mathematical geniuses. So after a year or two, they decide, you're not a mathematical genius. So he drops out of the mathematical concentration and he shifts to applied mathematics. Then after another year, they decide, well, he's not special in applied mathematics either. Then he goes into economics. So, the, 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 the most characteristic profile of an American graduate student, PhD student in economics today is he's a failed mathematician. So he doesn't know history, he doesn't know anything, he doesn't know philosophy. He, now, what can you expect from such a person? What, what can he do? What does he know? So, the, so that's half of the problem. Now I'll tell you the other half of the problem. So among the graduate students, half of them are Americans with this profile, often with this profile that I've just described. Uh, uh, half of them are foreigners. Now I can look at the foreigners from my own country. And I, I think I told this story in an earlier class. So uh, a young middle class Brazilian comes to Harvard to the Harvard Economics Department as a PhD student with this idea. I'm going to write a thesis attacking the ne neoclassical marginalist economics. Huh? Uh, and uh, a different direction for economic theory and so forth. Then he goes and talks to his doctoral advisors. And they don't have the foggiest idea what he's talking about. Uh, it's not that they're going to, they want to suppress him. They just can't help him. Huh? And nothing in his prior education in Brazil equips him with the instruments to execute this project. So then he has a sense, he ends up writing a thesis applying the established economics, neoclassical economics, to some aspect of 
Brazilian, the Brazilian economy. Like he writes a thesis on the Brazilian hyperinflation, 1975 to 1985, something like that. So this person then has an experience of failure, right? It's, it's a calamity because he, he can't become what he set out to become. He's a thinker, an opponent, so forth. So then he says, then, then he remembers Rousseau. Huh? Rousseau wrote, they couldn't become rich. They couldn't become men. Therefore, they decided to become rich. So this, so this person thinks, well, I'm, I'm going to go back to Brazil. At least I'm not going to be poor, right? I, because if you're middle class there, you're nothing, right? You're dust. So he says, I, now how can I become rich if I'm a Harvard PhD in economics? I'm going to go work in the central bank because the central bankers in that country, instead of having a brilliant past, have a brilliant future. And they're going to work in the central bank and then they're going to jump from the central bank to one of the finance houses after they've worked for a few years in the central bank. And then they start becoming rich. And those are the people who have conducted our economic policies now for several generations. Uh, who, and their experience, it, they, they, they've succeeded in the world, but they have ex at the same time the experience of failure. And that's a large part of